Well, welcome to the 31st episode this year of Free Speech Zone. Uh, I just want to point out that it's totally free. Why don't you come on down and become a video producer? And, you know, virtually any effort will be better than mine. So come on down and put in your two cents worth on TV. In the meantime, uh, I guess what I'll, I'll start out talking about gentrification this time. That's where the the big power forces force you out of your home, move you on, and uh, then they move in and develop it and sell it for it at such a high price that nobody but really well-to-do people can move in. And it forces all the poor people out, uh, retired people, people of lower social economic classes, of which I was the member of that, you yeah. <clears throat> Now I'm a member of that and retired people. But uh, one of the... One of the best, most investigated and, you know, recently exposed example of gentrification was, you know, during Katrina. Now, we just had the anniversary, and Greg Palast has done the best, maybe the only real journalism in, in the area. And, uh, man, does he nail it. So... I, now here's this it's kind of interesting. We'll see if I get a copyright violation on my YouTube channel for this because it's a democracy now clip, but I have permission from Greg Palace to show his videos. Now you figure it out, but I'll go ahead and show it. It's educational purposes, folks, so we're gonna go for it. And uh, I'll see you when we get back. Put these gates up on my 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 windows and things. Katrina didn't have me walking out here looking for somewhere to stay. Man did this. This was man made. They wanted them poor niggas out of there, and they ain't had no intention to allow it to be reopened to no poor niggas, you know. And that's just the bottom line. Our president says he hasn't forgotten a promise he made here. I want the people down there to understand that it's going to take a while to recover. This is a huge storm. Well, Mr. President, I think people down here know it was a huge storm. Over half a million of them fled the flood. It's been a full year, and only 170,000, far less than half, have come back, almost none to their own homes. Stayed three nights here and one night um, on the bridge. So you were three nights stuck in the flood. Right here. Yeah. And they weren't looking for you. We had helicopters, but they none didn't pass, and at least they passed over us. I'm on the roof holding my shirt out and saying that we had babies back here. This is Stephen Smith. Like 127,000 others in this town, he didn't have a car in which to escape. So he was left in the rising waters. Stranded in the heat on a bridge, he closed the eyes of a man who died of dehydration after giving his grandchildren his last bottle of water. What kind of evacuation plan would leave 127,000 to sink or swim? It turns out that the Bush administration had contracted out evacuation planning to a corporation, IEM, Innovative Emergency Management. I couldn't locate their qualifications, but I did locate their list of donations to the Republican Party. We went to Baton Rouge to talk to them. These are the offices of Innovative Emergency Management. They're the ones that were paid a half million bucks to come up with an emergency evacuation plan for the city of New Orleans before Hurricane Katrina. One problem is, I can't find the plan. So I'm coming here to ask them about it. So when I showed up at their office, they would only talk to me from behind a glass wall by phone. Did you in fact come up with a plan? Because it says it's urgent to come up with a plan. Did you come, can you just tell me if you came up with a plan or not? Yeah. I'm just happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. You're, you're probably about 12 feet away from me. <laughs> or somewhere, you know, I mean, I don't know, are you hiding in this office somewhere? I'm happy to speak to you face to face. We can't find your plan, neither can FEMA that you were paid a half million dollars for it, that at least claimed to hear. We can't find this plan. And it's kind of a problem, I guess it's kind of hard to evacuate a city if you can't Can find I? the plan itself. 
She's got a lot of experience in evacuation. Is it more true that maybe it was helpful that she gave a lot of donations to the Republican Party? Maybe Terry? that's the experience? Yes. Yeah. So that's when they called in the guards. Ooh. Security has been called. We ask that you please leave the building now. So quickly, before security gets here, I just want to tell you that this is innovative emergency management. And it's very innovative not to have a plan to manage an emergency. I decided to look for someone with a little more experience in hurricane evacuation. LSU, Louisiana State University. They're just down the street from IEM. LSU has one hellacious football team. They also have the best team of hurricane experts in the nation. I met with Dr. Ivor Van Herden, Deputy Director of the University's elaborate Center for the Study of Hurricanes. I asked this renowned specialist about the reputation of IEM prior to their getting the half million dollar evacuation exercise contract. I hadn't heard of them prior to this exercise, no. The LSU scientists already had an evacuation model, but IEM and FEMA refused to use it. We had the science. We had really studied this thing. We knew what was going to go wrong. We had an enormous amount of information, right down to mapping with it, where the gas tanks were and, and pipelines. Science was basically ignored all the way through the process. The LSU professors warned, for example, that the IEM plan simply made no provision for people, the old, the sick, who couldn't escape in a car. I asked him the consequences of this oversight. Well, you know, 1,500 of them drowned. That's, that's the bottom line. Then the professor surprised me by saying that giving us this information put his job at risk. I wasn't going to let them, uh, let those sort of threats shut me down or any of the other sorts of nonsense that went on because it was so important that we get out what had gone wrong and why. Apparently, the heat from the university originated with a state official who now works for IEM. We got a phone call from somebody in the state government who actually now works for IEM, but uh, I don't think that was his plan at the time. And he jumped all over me and said by criticizing their work, I was putting the whole exercise in jeopardy, and if I did it again, I would be banned. Back in New Orleans, former city councilman Broad Baggard, a lawyer, standing in the gutted wreckage of his own home, did not think kindly of the concealment of Van Herden's warnings. Ongoing protection that should have been occurring was done, it was done negligently. Not only wrong, negligently. And not only negligently, but reckless negligence. The kind of negligence for which an individual would be indicted, prosecuted, tried, convicted, and spend their life in jail. Negligence that killed people, lots of people. Reckless negligence that killed human beings. And old ladies watched the water come up to their nose, over their eyes, and they drowned in houses just like this in this neighborhood because of reckless negligence that's unanswered for. So now we've discovered why there is no real plan of escape. But that leaves the question, why did the water flood the city? People drowned. The city drowned. Destroyed house, destroyed house, destroyed house, destroyed house, destroyed house. Every single house on every single block, mile after mile after mile of residential urban neighborhoods are completely destroyed and remain destroyed. Bagger took us to a neighbor's house near the levee. So look, you have three feet of mud in here. There's a basketball. You know, some children's toys. One day it was somebody's home, the next day it's a, it's like a mad monster came through it. The beast. There's an X on this house. It has a five under it. That means that five corpses were pulled out of here. Five people who were killed and they weren't killed by Katrina. They were killed by this, a levee, which is supposed to protect them from the waters of the Mississippi, and it failed. And they never told the five in there that they knew it would fail. FEMA knew at 11 o'clock on Monday that the levees had breached. At 2 o'clock, they flew over the 17th Street Canal. 
and took video of the breach. By midnight on Monday, the White House knew. But none of us knew. Back at LSU, Van Heerden's experts warned the Bush administration about levees long before Katrina hit. I myself briefed many, many uh, senior uh, federal officials, including somebody from the White House. Without the warning that the levees had begun to break, evacuation stopped until it was too late. But those that survived, where were they? This city is still half empty. Investigative journalist Greg Pallas. This piece was produced by Jackie Suen of Big Noise Films, part two, in a minute. Hurricane came through, fuck the sub round here. Government acting like it's bad luck down here. All I know is that you better bring some trucks round here. Wonder why I got my middle finger up round here. People lives on the line, you decline in the hell. Since you taking so much time, we survive in ourselves. Just me and my pets and my kids and my spouse trapped in my own house looking for a way out. Tell them that we need to get out. Five days in this motherfucker attic. Can't use the cell phone, I keep getting static. Dying cause they lying instead of telling us the truth. Other day the helicopters got my neighbors off the roof. Off the screw cause they said they're coming back for us too. That was three days ago. I don't see no rescue. See a man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. George Bush, Don't Like Black People by Legendary KO. This was produced, the music break, by Frank Lopez. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Hurricane Katrina flooded 80 percent of New Orleans, destroying the city's infrastructure, displacing most of its residents. A year later, only about half of New Orleans' population of 450,000 people has returned. Many of those unable to come back are poor and African-American. In the ravaged, mostly black neighborhood of the Lower Ninth Ward, only 1,000 of the 20,000 people who live there there before Katrina have returned. This has drastically altered the demographics of a city that used to be two-thirds black. Activists and residents have condemned the government's refusal to reopen the city's public housing projects and point out that while tourist areas are being developed, affordable housing is not being built. Many are asking, who is New Orleans being rebuilt for? Here again, investigative reporter Greg Pallast from New Orleans. Oh. What is We drove back to New Orleans to find out what happened to those who tried to return. What's wrong though? Oh, it's, they, it's, they're just messing all over. What are, they, what are they doing? Putting you out your own house. No, we ain't got nowhere to go. You call them back saying we could come back home. Then we get there, they got the police coming in there putting us out. And all this, they're harassing us. Oh no, this is not right. I'm basically between here and Texas. Coming to, you know, coming to see if I could get my house back. And I'm, you know, but I'm, at, I'm in Texas, but I'm coming down here to see about my house. But they said they ain't letting nobody in and all this. But where we gonna go at though? Where is we gonna go at? What and happened? then they told us to come back. What happens tonight? Where are you gonna go tonight? That's what I want to know, mister. I don't know where I'm going, me and my kids. Her friend Patricia Thomas was also locked out of her home in the Lafitte housing project. The next day, we helped her break into her apartment, barred by metal plates. This is my porch right here. I think I might take my little break and sit on it for a minute. Yeah, this is my porch here. The city has sealed up almost all public housing, but these apartments were never touched by water. It was nearly perfect. In this it's been a year. It's been a year and my house is looking good like that. I think you and I together, just the two of us, could put your place back together in a week. You see? No and problem. No problem at all. But they won't let her in. And this has nothing to do with Katrina. Katrina didn't do this. Maine did this. Katrina didn't come in my house and put these gates up on my, my, my windows and things. Katrina didn't have me walking out here looking for somewhere to stay. Maine did this. This was man me. This is not what we think of as public housing in America. These places are gorgeous, two and three-story townhouses with iron porticos. 
Why would the city spend thousands of dollars per unit to armor these places, kick out the tenants? Well, the answer may be over here. This is the downtown business district. We are halfway between there and the Tony French Quarter. In other words, this is some very expensive real estate. For years, the city and speculators have been trying to get the tenants out of these apartments. Katrina, the perfect storm, was the perfect excuse. So what kind of New Orleans do they want? This is the new New Orleans, stripped down, downsized, not too black, just right for tourists. You could call it Six Flags over Louisiana. They call this drink a hurricane. But across the Mississippi, far from the quarter, not everyone is thrilled with this brave new New Orleans of tourists and Mardi Gras. It's two cities. You know, it's the city for the white and the rich, and there's another city for the poor and blacks. You know, the city that's for the white and rich is recovered. They had a, a jazz fest, they had a Mardi Gras, they're going to have the Saints plan for those who have recovered. But for those who haven't recovered, there's nothing. Malik Rahim is a leader of Common Ground, a grassroots recovery organization. He explains why Patricia and others are locked out of their apartments. They didn't want to open it up. They wanted them closed. They wanted them poor niggas out of there. And they ain't had no intention to allow it to be reopened to no poor niggas. You know, and that's just the bottom line. Malik's group isn't waiting on George Bush to get around to housing the surviving poor. This is the unit we are getting together. Common Ground is completing almost as many homes as the Bush administration. But who is left and who will stay? This is the Lower Ninth Ward, or I should say was the Lower Ninth Ward, an African-American working class neighborhood. There's no potable water here. There's no electricity. There's no nothing. There's just no way to return. And a lot of residents feel that's exactly the plan. This is Mr. Henry Irving Sr. He has no neighbors, no water, no electricity. But he is not leaving. They want us to leave. That's what they want us to do. They want us to get discouraged and leave. So why leave? Where I'm going now? I'm going to go to another community. I put all my life in this community. I'm going to stay here, and if God's willing, I'm going to be here long enough to see it come back. So can it happen again? Another hurricane, another flood? Don't worry, because the government has hired a consulting firm to analyze what went wrong with the response to Katrina. It's a little firm from Baton Rouge called Innovative Emergency Management. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, <laughs> the director was just poking his head in to say something just when the video ended. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, okay. Now, there's something that I want to remind people about, and that's the way they rewrite history. Uh, the kids that are coming up these days are, you know, think that they're discovering all these abuses for themselves for the first time, and that you know they're different from any other generation because they understand what's going on or they don't understand or whatever it is but the point is the history is being denied them they have no idea first of all that activism is very effective revolutionary activism is very effective in fact you might say even necessary some people say that we would not have had any of the civil rights legislation if there hadn't been the riots in Harlem. I mean, in, in Watts. Maybe Harlem, too. I don't know. But anyway, Watts. And uh, so, you know, 
we have no idea of of the history of the of the uh, protesters during the Vietnam War and how effective they were or were not. We, I mean, there just isn't any. <clears throat> they don't even talk about it except as a you know an anomaly, a group that got together and was against the war for some strange reason. They're against war, unlike the citizens today who know rightfully that war is what we need. War is good. Strength, weakness is strength. Strength is weakness. Orwell, <laughs> Orwellian. Okay, well, what we've got here is a video um, from Chris Hedges again, and he's one of the only people that's really talking about anything revolutionary. But, you know, I'll, the first thing that our society did was put all of these so called revolutionaries in jail. And the, the ones that became revolutionaries in jail were stifled in jail. And uh, we're going to show this. Chris is, Hedges is interviewing two survivors of the prison system. They had both been in solitary for inhumane amount of time. Any time is inhumane. But Well, go ahead and run this, and this is uh, 25 minutes. Now you talk about terror. <laughs> I've been terrorized all my day. I'm all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Hedges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. In this segment, we're going to discuss resistance inside the prison system by black radicals who created, in essence, uh, the vast network of uh, solitary confinement cells known as management control units uh, to isolate them from the rest of the prison population so they would not teach revolution. Uh, and their presence saw the rise of numerous techniques, uh, including the infusion of SWAT teams, all sorts of psychological mechanisms to break people down, uh, to snuff out uh, a movement that the state uh, found to be deeply disruptive, especially in its internal colonies, as Malcolm X called them. Joining me in the studio are two revolutionaries who spent uh, tremendous amounts of time, not only in prison, but in solitary confinement. Uh, Ogery Latulo, 28 years in prison, 22 of those years in isolation. And Eddie Conway, 44 years in prison uh, for a crime he did not commit, uh, seven years in isolation. Is that correct, Eddie? So, you both went into the prison in the 1970s. What year exactly was it, Audrey? <clears throat> well, you know, the early 70s. Early 70s, and you? 1970 itself. 1970 itself. And this was a time when the state uh, was making war against radical leftist movements, not only uh, the groups you were in, Eddie was a member of the Black Panthers, Audrey was a member of the Black Liberation Army, but the American Indian Movement, the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, as well as even uh, white uh, anti-war radicals. And uh, just as they were attempting to break these movements outside prison walls, once you arrived inside prison walls, it became personal. Uh, they were going to break these movements by breaking you, and that's largely what solitary was about, to break you psychologically, to isolate you from the rest of the prison population so that you couldn't raise political consciousness uh, among younger prisoners who were coming into the system. Um, and we still have about 150 black radicals, uh, Sundiata Akoli, and others, Mumia Abu Jamal, who remain behind prison walls. Um, what were the techniques, let's start with you, Eddie, by which you were able to resist in this almost perfect totalitarian state? 
Well, I think initially, uh, my first seven years was spent in solitary confinement because you really had to fight back and you had to resist. Uh, and resisting could be something as simple as refusing to leave the dining room if you're not finished eating. And that was considered an act of uh, resistance, an uh, act of uh, uh, riotous. Uh, and you were attacked for stuff like that. So uh, By the guards. By the guards, right? And so pretty much what we did was like every time they pushed, we had to push back. And it led to a lot of combat, it led to a lot of conflicts, and it led to a lot of segregation time. But at some point, they got exhausted and they stopped attacking us. So you had, you were physically assaulted by a guard whose baton you took. Yeah. And you were charged with not only assault, but theft, theft of the baton. Yes. And was that the incident where your jaw was broken? Uh, uh, no, that wasn't, but there was another incident. Right. Yeah. You were pretty badly beat up. Yes. Yes, I've had my shoulder broken, my right. jaw broken, et cetera. I think that's something that many people outside the system don't understand, and that is uh, that just as our militarized police forces can carry out indiscriminate lethal force on the streets, they carry out indiscriminate beatings and very brutal beatings uh, within the prison system itself. And there was uh, an interesting article in the New York Times uh, recently where they uh, interviewed prisoners from the Clinton Correctional Facility uh, and in the immediate aftermath, there was, this is where we had the prison escape by Richard Madden, David Sweat, uh, and in the hours afterwards, prisoners were taken to uh, broom closets, uh, badly beaten, uh, plastic bags were put over their heads until they suffocated all of this while they were handcuffed. Other prisoners were slammed against walls, slammed against uh, uh, you know, bars themselves, heads banged into walls. Um, and this is kind of the currency within prisons where the goal is to make everyone obedient and everyone subservient. Um, and you, Ogery, spending 22 years in isolation, which is almost unfathomable, um, what were the mechanisms by which you retained your humanity and retained your ability to resist? Well, so I went to prison as a revolutionary, and as a revolutionary, I came to terms with the process of death and captivity. Plus, I always had a strong sense of self and purpose, and had an ideology, right? And so that sustained me to the 22 years. When everybody else abandoned me, it was on me to come up with survival tactics, right? What were they? I would, uh, I, I, I created what I call a cell program. I would get up in the morning, I would read, write exercise, you know, start working on my collages, right? And that was a big part of my survival, right? You know, creating collages, right, about political commentary, what, what's going on. This with is where I've seen them. It's where you would rip up newspapers and magazines and write political messages. <laughs> and all I had was magazines and, and glue, Elmer's glue. And, now, and then I would do a lot. I would do a lot, a lot of outside uh, interviews with people on a national, international level, right? You didn't wear a prison uniform. Yes, I did. It, but wasn't there times when you were? Oh, 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 at, at one time, you, you could wear civilian clothing. No, but weren't you naked in the cells? From oh, yeah. Well, at one time they put me in a uh, in a in a mental health unit for That's six what days. Right. They held me incommunicado in the mental health unit for six days. They took all my clothing. Right. Left me standing next to a pole of uh, rainwater. And the rain outside would rain into the cell. And it was freezing cold, light stayed on 24 hours a day. I was on the camera watch. No. Uh, Eddie, I know that you attempted to organize prisoners. Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit about that, what, what you did once you got into the prison system. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, let me just go step back one second, but I will answer that. Uh, I think their goal was was not the obedience and subservience. I think their goal was to dehumanize mm. every prisoner. Because you have a dehumanized prisoner, then you can control him and the environment. Uh, uh, one of the things that was happening was we were getting paid nine cents an hour. So I organized a United Labor Prison Union. union. Uh, and we demanded minimum wage, which at that time probably wasn't that much, four or five dollars an hour. But 
it was that effort that got the, the most reaction from the guards and the administration when prisoners decided that they were human beings and they deserved to be paid for their labor in spite of what the 13th Amendment says that says that, right. that we could be uh, subjected to slavery as prisoners. Uh, the, the reaction was, 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 was hostile and swift and uh, eventually they locked us all up and shut the prison down and everything because we wanted to be treated like human beings. So, and it was every place that we organized, we organized a library because we wanted to learn. We, we pushed for control of a radio that we could talk to each other. Uh, everything we organized that would enhance our humanity, they attacked. The interesting dilemma we face at the moment is that because the mechanisms by which reform are made possible no longer work, that attempt to organize around the minimum wage issue is, I'm asking, I guess, but I suspect is the last weapon we have to break the back of mass incarceration where we in the United States hold 25% of the world's prison population and are 5% of the world's population because it is based on a system of neo-slavery. Prisons function like plantations and prisons would not be able to sustain themselves without the uh, highly undercompensated or even free labor. Uh, as you know, everything in the prison is virtually done by the prisoners uh, from the barber shop to the cooking of the guards' foods to shining the one of the most highly paid jobs in the New Jersey prison system are the, are the boot blacks, the people who shine the boots of the guards all day long. Um, and if they had to compensate at minimum wage, the system would collapse. And I'm wondering if that, in your estimation, is the primary mechanism now that we have to fight back against the, mass, the system of mass incarceration in the United States, or there are others. What do you think, Audrey? I think... Uh, <clears throat> But we need to organize. That's, that's the only solution to the problem at this point. Inside and outside. Inside and outside. But organizing or, around minimum wage? No, no, no. Organize against oppression. It's so like inside Chinese State Prison, you don't have any jobs. Right. That's a supermax prison. Supermax, no. You just, it's a lockdown. Right. So you got to organize. That's, that's lockdown means 23 hours a day. Well, no, no but for prisoners in the management patrol unit. Right. It's 23 hours one day and you know, one day out. Right. So you have to organize. And that's to be done on a political level. And that's what the administrators are afraid of. What does that look like? What's that? I mean, what do you mean organize? Organize. You have to educate people about the reality of their oppression, for, of their oppression and the fact that we don't control the economics in our communities, right? And you have to give people hope, reason to struggle, something to struggle for. But right? isn't the only mechanism prisoners have by which they can fight back our work stoppages. But it's no work inside the Chinese State Prison, so we have to organize on another level. Right. Yeah. But you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to have to disagree, uh, and I'm disagreeing because even in those Supermax, Ultramax, we have one here in Maryland, when, when you take away the prison labor, it stops working. In the, in the Supermax, even though guys are behind those doors 23 hours, somebody's in the mess hall cooking the food. Right. Somebody's in the laundry washing the, the stuff. Somebody's in the commissary bagging up the, the stuff. Somebody mops the floor. Somebody brings the shell in, in, in Cumberland, Maryland, say for instance, you don't get out your cell, you go in a little telephone booth shell that rolls from cell to cell. Somebody rolls that shell down there. Somebody cleans it later on. Somebody picks up the trays. See, all of that stuff is work that we do that sometimes we don't recognize that if we stop doing all of that work, the prison system well, will collapse. Well, they also, isn't it true that in a supermax prison like Trenton, they'll bring in minimum security prisoners to do this work, they right? Do that. This, but they, still prisoners doing the work. This bring me from Jones Farm. Right. They would, they, would bring, they would cart the food in. Right. I mean, I'm assuming neither of you have faith in the system, the legislative system or the electoral system to bring about reform or not? No. No, no. way. So what is the, how do we destroy the system of mass incarceration? I mean, what is the mechanism? I'm, I'm definitely for prisoner labor unions. 
You, if you and, and, and they have tried this in other states. If you organize labor unions and you demand minimum wage, it takes the money off of the prison right. industrial complex, and they can no longer afford to incarcerate people like that. Right. They keep them long term like that because below the maximum levels in the medium and the minimum levels, we're making uh, uh, furniture, we're making license tags, we're making clothes, we are... Uh, uh, McDonald's. Uh, yeah, we're training those. We're doing all sorts of things oh, that's, right. that's creating the fish. wealth. Raising uh, fish farms. Yeah, raising fish farms. Oh, and right at on. the same time, we are supplying a way in which the guard forces make a living. Right. You know, so if you take the money away from that, then they'll start letting people Well, out. if you look at the 2010 work stoppage in the Georgia state prison system, that cost the state of Georgia, which I think only lasted, if I remember correctly, nine days, mm -hmm. cost them millions of dollars. Um, yeah. And that I, goes back to what Audrey said. It, that's not going to work until you raise the consciousness of those inside the prison. Mm -hmm. um, but we have seen now decades of attempts on the part of the liberal establishment to institute reforms, both in terms of policing and in terms of mass incarceration, and the situation on the streets and inside the prisons have only gotten worse. <clears throat> what they do is they, they grant reforms, and then when everything becomes like, peaceful, they take the reforms back. I, I don't know what avenue we have left. I mean, the largest influx now of prisoners are women. Uh, you're seeing a larger and larger increase of poor white people coming into the prison system as they run out, in essence, of black bodies by which they can put in cages. 75,000 prisoners in this country live in isolation. Uh, Britain puts three to four people a year in isolation. Uh, and that kind of sophistication of control, and I know you went through it, Audrey. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about it, but you know, it's not just a matter of being in an isolated cell. It's a matter of being woken up in the middle of the night, extreme <clears throat> hot, extreme cold. I mean, uh, I know you've been have spoken about being moved, you know? They used to wake, up, wake us up every other morning with attack dogs. The security guards would be in riot gear. They was, we were stripped, we were like, we were like back out the cell naked, and we had attack dogs pulling on the least straining at our private parts. They was moved from one cell to another cell and just repeat the same thing every other morning for months on end. Then another time, they had me on what is called a, a no contact status, whereas I couldn't do anything with a group or another individual, right? I'd have to go to the yard by myself and my visits by myself, right? So I was a victim of what you call no touch torture. Right. So their goal was to break me psychologically. They placed me in a bloody cell after a prisoner had committed attempted suicide, took his blood and painted the cell red, right? And it was, it was, it was, it was never ending. But I think we should be clear that it often works. People do break down. Oh, people do break. But see, but, but I, I, see, I study psychological warfare. I, stu I study the methods of breaking a person's mind. What's the brother Marion, Eddie Griffin, he wrote a book called Breaking Men's Minds, right? So I, so I read that. Now, and I was circulating that amongst the prison, prison and the control unit so they could prepare themselves for, uh, to combat uh, this method of uh, uh, no touch torture. We also have the phenomenon of which is not spoken about very much, prison executions, some of which never get reported at all. We just saw uh, at California State Prison Hugo Pino, who was part of the San Quentin Six, uh, knife to death. It was it in the prison yard, Eddie? Um, but that's common. I mean, there, we just had a case in New Jersey where a uh, 28-year-old prisoner in Southwoods was uh, it appears beaten to death. Um, his body was returned to his family in Trenton, completely covered with contusions, broken bones, and they said he died of a heart attack. Um, that is a mechanism of control, uh, a cr creating a kind of climate of terror and fear, uh, along with rape. Um, an estimated 200,000 prisoners are raped in prison in the United States every year. Uh, and I think we should say that for many of these prisoners, this is daily rape. It's not a one-time incident because you get these particular figures who prey on, they call them the new fish, you know, these young kids who come into the prison. Uh, so much of the oppression that happens with inside American prison systems are either tolerated or even orchestrated by the guards, but are carried out by 
prisoners themselves. And perhaps you can, and then we haven't even spoken about informants, but maybe you can speak to that, Eddie, first. Uh, yes, I mean, there's certain benefits and privileges that a uh, certain class of prisoners get for carrying out the uh, wishes and the duties of the administration. Say if you're hostile, they will, uh, uh, or say if you're organizing, you're a political organizer, they will direct the people that they have under their control, whether through the use of bringing in drugs to them or giving them some other benefits. They use those people to attack progressives, activists, revolutionaries, or just prison organizers that's organizing in an area in which they don't want that to happen. That happens a lot. Then also, probably, they use prisoners to do things that they want done and reward them by transferring them to other institutions with lesser security uh, and so on. So, um, In the prison I teach in, they give yeah. them a cheeseburger and they say there are prisoners who will sell out another prisoner yeah. for a cheeseburger. Well, I've seen, I've seen uh, uh, prisoners turn in their best friends uh, to go to the camp center. You know, uh, sometimes friends that they've known for 10, 20 years, right. and they will snitch on them and form on them so that they can be transferred out, and their friend will end up in the supermax or maximum security and in with a longer sentence. And I'm just going to close, Audrey, by asking you, and if there's time, Eddie, maybe you can comment as to whether they've been successful, whether, um, you know, that successful assault on radical movements outside prison walls, um, which has eradicated those militants that fought for significant social change, uh, has been successful inside prison walls as well. It, it, it has up to a point because I've seen people who came, came into the Trojan Strong leave weak. Mm -hmm. I've seen people who came in weak became strong. So a lot depends on the individual, on what, what composition, his internal composition, psychologically. But in, but in terms of a radical consciousness, do you think the prison system has been successful in essentially keeping the majority of the prison population in darkness? Yes, but mainly because the, like the, 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 the revolutionary element, they removed it from the general population. Right. So they don't have anybody to show them another way or give them that particular book they might need to read. Which is why you were 22 years in solitary. Exactly. He told me, I told him that I haven't done anything. He said, you could if you wanted to. Right. And that's the thought crime. Right. right. But, uh, but again, they, 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 isolation is effective in terms of breaking some people. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's right. also effective in, in quarantine, keeping radicals quarantined. Well, definitely. <clears throat> but you know, the other side of that too is that, that a, a lot of activists have been developed in prison as a result of them putting us in the prison system. A lot of mentors have been, been developed and it's, it's the change in methodology of organizing, but organizing still go on. But the one thing that also shows a failure of prison is that the, the rebelliousness of the street organizations. There's a, a, a tremendous amount of street organization participation in the prison system and they are rebelling. And they're rebelling and they're resisting and they resist the guards as well as they resist society in general without direction in most cases, but still rebellion. I mean, the question we have to ask now is whether the state has pushed people on the streets and in the system and prisoners are leaving prison now in debt, um, that they've just gone too far and that we may see uh, the rise of a new revolutionary movement born out of this repression uh, and hopefully informed by uh, your own revolutionary activity. I don't know if you see this coming or not. I, I see I see it coming within the walls of Trinity State Prison. I see it coming within the confines of Raleigh State Prison. Mm. Prisons are, don't have a choice. They said, what are we supposed to do? You took everything from us. Yeah. What, what, what's left? What to organize and rebel? But if that element is not there to feed them, it's, it's, it becomes more difficult to feed them that political knowledge, you know, to organize them in terms of a, a phone strike or things of that nature, right? Right. And, and, and we're definitely, as in America, on the 
a verge of a change. I mean, there's a new kind of sense of urgency to make changes, to challenge, uh, whether it is environmental or whether it's in, in integration uh, or whether it's uh, uh, the trans communities or whether it's Black Lives Matter or Occupy or so on. There is a sense or, or, or against the uh, national security state, there's a sense that things are wrong and this is not working and it's not working in the interest of the majority of the people and people are starting to question that and the questions eventually will lead to answers they might not learn from our example but they'll learn from reading and studying and so on uh, but uh, and i think that's why you have such a surveillance state uh, developing because it's not just now people on the ground but it's also uh, the greater uh, population of uh, white people also. Right, because they didn't stop with poor people of color. Yeah. Once they finished with them, um, they've turned on the poor working class and even the yeah. white middle class. They don't have any self-imposed limits. Yeah. Um, and so let's hope they follow your example. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Okay, now very quickly, uh, next week is the 14th anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy where our rogue elements within our own government killed our own people. Um, it's, yeah, see so here you go. 9-11 was an inside job. I'm a member of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And if anybody out there like PDX 9-11 group or anybody wants to have a space on my next show. It'll be on the 12th, the day after 9-11. You could do a recap or something. Uh, but otherwise, you'll leave it up to me. In the meantime, did you know that right after 9-11, George Bush considered nuking Afghanistan? Well, that's what's wrong with letting anybody have nukes, is because they, they think they're justified by events when it's obvious that a false flag was done. And if they had nuked Ara or, or Afghanistan, it would have been even worse. Go ahead and roll this one. New details are emerging about the U.S.'s nuclear consideration in Afghanistan in the weeks following the 9-11 attacks. This, of course, on the heels of the 70th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings when the U.S. dropped atomic bombs there, instantly killing hundreds of thousands of innocent civilian, civilians and severely injuring millions more. Now, Der Spiegel spoke with Michael Steiner, the current German ambassador to India, who at the time served as former Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder's policy aide. Steiner told Der Spiegel that there were documents drawn up and that George W. Bush's administration considered all options. So joining me now to discuss these revelations is attorney and media critic Lionel of Lionel Media. Lionel, what is your reaction to this story? Well, without passing on the specifics or the accuracy of the story, the, the world is obviously better off when any consideration of using nukes uh, never materializes. But, but let's look at the issue of Afghanistan nonetheless. You know, the first question, Manila, is who are alleged to be the culprits of 9-11? Well, the answer, the Taliban and or Al-Qaeda under bin Laden's orders. What connection did Afghanistan have to Al-Qaeda and bin Laden? The UN Charter makes it clear that self-defense against a nation is warranted, but none of the alleged hijackers were Afghanis. And this also shows the complexity of war when prosecuted as terrorism. So was bin Laden harbored and protected by Afghanistan, or was he merely in Afghanistan? Great question, but now let's fast forward 10 years to May 2011, 10 years from 9-11. During the Obama administration, uh, this sort of generation's JFK moment, right, where you remember exactly where you were, what you were doing when the news broke that bin Laden was killed. After so many years, the U.S. searched for him in Afghanistan. Turns out he was in Pakistan. Uh, they could have been harboring him all along. We're not sure. But why was Pakistan, why wasn't pa Pakistan targeted for nukes, rather? Well, which version do you want to go by? Do you want to go by Seymour Hersh's version, where he suggested that at Pakistani intelligence harbored bin Laden? And don't forget, this was in Abbottabad. This was basically downtown Abbottabad in a mansion that kind of stuck out like the proverbial sore thumb in a town which was like their West Point. And then you had so many versions of what happened then. 
You also had, remember, that famous picture of the Situation Room, where Leon Panetta said later on that the looks of horror and disgust on the various individuals in the White House could not have seen that because the live feed was down. Do you want to believe that story? And then you have to ask, well, why was bin Laden killed immediately? And which version do you want to hear? I'm not trying to make light of it, but there were so many versions and so many um, uh, elements of what happened. So the question is, one theory is that Pakistan, according to Cy Hirsch and others, actually had him in their grasp. So if that's the reason, if that's the basis for a nuclear attack, this bodes serious consideration in the future to somebody who might have somebody that we want. Well, lots of questions still remaining, but definitely nukes, bad word, I think. Thank you so much for chiming in. That was attorney and Emmy Award winning media critic Lionel. Thank you. <laughs> attorney and Emmy Award winning media critic Lionel. You can find him on YouTube at Lionel Nation, I think they call it. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of like some of his commentary. Some of it, you know, not exactly agreeing with what I think, but that's all right. It's still fun to watch him. And, in fact, we're going to go and watch another one because uh, the issue is how do you know that what you're looking at on the Internet has any validity at all? I mean, how do you know? Well, that's what this next clip with Lionel talks about. Well, to discuss this further, we're joined now by Lionel, a legal analyst and also media commentator. Thanks very much for coming on to the programme uh, this evening. Um, what have you made of this story? I mean, this information that we've been talking about there hasn't been really verified in any way. Um, well, what's your take on all of this? I'm surprised it took this long. I'm surprised that we haven't found more of these. I'm surprised for a variety of reasons. Look, there is a presumption of correctness that people have. The better the site, the better the graphics, the better the layout, the more it's trusted. We're now in a world that turns to Wikipedia as an absolute fact basis. After all, it's Wikipedia. Then we have satire sites. We have The Onion here, where people have sometimes confused The Onion with actual news. Sometimes people have actually cited deliberately bogus and satirical sites because there is a presumption, a presumption of correctness, a presumption of legitimacy. And what you've done now is now you have caused other people to, dare I say, question. You're asking people now to take something that is presented and go behind the headlines. You're now making people around the world do their job and verify the legitimacy of claims. Do you have any idea of the repercussions of this story? People, journalists, are now going to have to figure out and verify the validity of that which they report? For shame. <laughs> I mean, presumably, well, we know they do on, on many stories, but on this occasion, they've decided just to pick up this story and run with it. I mean, are you not surprised uh, at the lack of questioning that went on from, from some major publications? Well, that's the part that gets me. And if you look at the provenance of this author, you would think that especially when the subject matter is such that is by its very nature very very intriguing and very very shocking you would think that there would be a little bit of an inquiry just to play it safe but the internet and the graphics have created the illusion again a presumption of correctness and, and what we're going to find out is more and more of these stories more and more of these websites are going to be set up in the hope that nobody will check them. I'm surprised, and I'm, and I'm being completely candid, I am surprised it took this long for something like this to come to the surface. There are other stories like this, and there is going to be a ripple effect, I hope, throughout newsrooms all over the world to not necessarily believe everything that you see on the internet. I mean, you, it's axiomatic to me. Lionel, but do you think that... again, apparently not in this case. And do you think that will extend to the wider public as well? Will, will this ripple 
go across you know, the public in America, for example. What, what's your, um, what are your thoughts on that? What, what has been, I mean, have you sensed, uh, when you've seen this story and talked to the public about it, have you sensed that they are sort of appalled by what they see as well, or are they just pushing it to one side and say, oh, this sort of thing happens? No. Simple Nothing answer. Nothing appalls that. <laughs> Listen, to give, a, to give you an example, there is, a, there is a joke on the internet that says, never believe everything you read on the internet. And it cites Abraham Lincoln. It's a joke. And it shows you the inherent irony and the, the satire of that. Do you know how many people I've seen actually cite that? Abraham Lincoln referring to the internet? Because there is again this presumption of correctness. I can tell you every single day there is a story that is absolutely absurd. And you will read online in various social media, which is another story, social media publications, where people will say, no, this is, a, this is satirical. When the onion started here in this country, people did not know what it was because it looked like a newspaper, felt like a newspaper, it had the graphics of a newspaper, and then again, the presumption of such took place. So the good news is that maybe, by virtue of this story and others, it will force newsrooms around the world to look deeper and not necessarily believe everything they see. I hope. I pray. Okay, Lionel, we'll leave it there, but good to talk to you as always. That was a Lionel Legal uh, Analyst, a media commentator from the States. Thank you. Okay, it, uh, that's a close-up of my T-shirt there. And Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth has just come out with a new pamphlet. Uh, I ordered up 20 of them, and I'll, we'll be talking about it on the next show for sure. I hope they get here in time, and I think they will. But uh, it's titled something about 9-11 Disinformation. It, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Because uh, we've gone through 14 years of... Uh, talking about 9-11 and you know it's the official story is still entrenched pretty heavily and new viewers are only seeing the official story uh, but we're making great headway almost all the world knows about it even if it isn't very popular here in the states well uh, <clears throat> in fact I was thinking about if I get those in time maybe we'll give some of them away during the show next week now any of you 9-11 guys go ahead and contact me and we'll put you on the show too. Uh, other than that, we'll see you the day after 9-11. That's 9-12. Uh, <laughs> That's the day we sent our troops to Afghanistan. It's funny that it was already on the president's desk on 9-10. Okay, see you next time. <laughs>